Welcome everyone to the November 22nd um, regular meeting of the Hadley School Committee. Um, may I have a motion to open the meeting? So moved. Okay, second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. And Heather will not be joining us. It's just the four of us this time. Um, adjustments to the agenda. Annie. Yes. Yeah, so if you're in the agenda, if the public is in the agenda, what I've started to do is shade when there are adjustments. So you can see all the shaded items are adjustments. Uh, we have um, Eric Sednick will take you briefly through the program of studies and some G G grade point average issues that we're addressing. Um, and an update on COVID-19 cases, acceptance of a donation from 4Rex Farm, uh, a review of a phase two for the athletic fields proposal, and a review of a draft letter to Senator Comerford about the continuation of school committee meetings on Zoom. And some corresponding votes to go with that are also adjustments to the agenda. Great, thank you very much. Um, it's now time for public comment. Uh, as a reminder to the public, um, you have three minutes to make a comment um, and um, we request that your comments be pertaining to the agenda items. And um, as always, we do not respond to the um, comment um, today, but we will factor it into future discussions. And um, so uh, to comment, please raise your digital hand and we'll start with Rachel Briggs. Rachel, let's uh, allow you to unmute. Great. And, Can yes. Yeah, okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. I'm the parent of a kindergartner at the elementary school. Um, I've spoken a couple of times about COVID and I'm here yet again to talk about more COVID issues. Um, the first thing I wanna do is give my thanks and applaud everything that Hadley's already doing. Um, you know, the longer the school year goes on, the more parents I talk to elsewhere, we, we're ahead of the game. Um, and so I, you know, we're doing great with the mask mandates. We're doing more distance than we have to. Our testing, uh, we got that going as soon as we could. Um, that was outside of our hands, you know, some of that. The contact tracing, uh, I appreciate all the information about the outbreaks and the positives we've had. Um, so we're doing so many great things. Uh, I am disappointed that outdoor lunches and snacks and other activities never came to fruition when the um, weather was allowing that. Uh, but today I really wanna focus on ways to increase the vaccination rates of our community. Um, and I know that, you know, the legalities of, uh, districts and municipalities doing a vaccination mandate are a little murky. And so what I want to suggest is that we do a positive messaging and incentive campaign um, and, and make that our approach to increasing vaccination rates. Uh, and so I suggest that we do some sort of school-wide incentives for benchmarks that are reached. So for example, and I want to note that these ideas I came up with are junk food related, so I'm of course not tied to that piece of it. But you know, for example, we could say when when all of Holyoke Elementary or all of, all of Hadley Elementary School hits 25%, um, you know, everybody gets donuts. And then when the whole school reaches 50%, we do a pizza party. And then when the whole school reaches 75%, you know, we do ice cream or something. Um, so the, and then we put, you know, a large visual up in the school somewhere, whether that's a thermometer or a ruler or a pie chart or something so the kids can all see it, right? Um, but the reason that I'm suggesting this is because it offers, it offers the administration and those of us who might help organize flexibility uh, because we can set any number of incentives. Um, and it offers kids and families privacy because it's an overall statistic. And so individuals aren't going to be forced to, won't be penalized or forced to disclose like a um, legitimate medical exemption to a vaccination uh, because it would be sort of a, a group school-wide thing. Uh, I do realize that this may need organizing and or fundraising. And as I have before, I want to offer my time and labor to the school. And I would be glad to help support any, even if it's not my idea, any sort of um, organizing or labor that needs, that could be done or needs to be done to uh, help increase our vaccination rates of our community, I want to, I would love to be part of it. 
Um, and the last thing I want to say is I advocate that we have a vaccination clinic. Uh, the school is a safe place for families and kids. We, you know, feel it. Uh, I think that a lot of families are more willing to go somewhere that feels safe uh, and that we keep it the same positive incentive based atmosphere, you know, balloons, snacks, you know, the vaccination clinic at uh, Atkinson Family Practice that I took my daughter to. Uh, that first weekend that we could she could get her vaccination you know there were snacks and stickers and things like that but you know a, a happy positive um team based atmosphere to you know uh to try and do this to protect our kiddos and and protect our more vulnerable um community members so uh thank you all for your time i as always i really appreciate i appreciate all the work you do so thank you Thank you, Rachel, not only for the ideas, but also for volunteering generously your time. And um, I will ask um, Jen, Dowd, and Annie to follow up with you. Um, so thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm going to see if there's another hand raised for additional public comment. Not seeing any, uh, we will move on. Thank you everyone for commenting. Um, all right, we're moving on to presentation and discussion items. Uh, item A, presentation of HES school strategy document and HES school council DEI goals. Jen. Hi, thank you so much for letting me present this evening. Um, you all were received a copy of my strategic document, so I'm just going to be taking some um, speaking on some notes and and talking about some of the highlights of the document itself. So just to start the 2021 2024 Hadley elementary school strategy document was structured around our core values, which are to provide a safe and supportive environment that fosters cooperation, critical thinking, creativity, integrity and a love of learning. In order to create this plan, various sources have been examined and have been provided and have provided the basis for our initiatives. Those sources include teacher and student feedback, HES school council feedback, principal survey information, leadership team feedback, and information received from consultants that have partnered with the district. You all received a copy of the strategic document, which is currently in draft form. Areas in which I'd like to highlight this evening are objectives that support the HES equity and action plan, creating strong structures to support student social emotional growth, and objectives that address academic gaps in achievement by strengthening our multi-tiered systems of support in ELA and in math. The first section I'd like to speak to is section A, instructional leadership. Some highlights include the creation of an HES literacy team that will examine our current curriculum and make recommendations to ensure rigor, relevance, and alignment to state standards. The team will support me in identifying and evaluating our current curriculum since we need to move forward with purchase, purchasing a new series by the end of this academic school year, and that's an ELA. The literacy team will also develop and implement school-wide rubrics to align and communicate student growth specific to our writing goals. We are also looking to continue our school-wide practices on examining data in ELA and math to incre increase student achievement through our multi-tiered systems of support. There has recently been a posting for a math interventionist based on teacher recommendations to help support staff with providing specific targeted math interventions for students. In section B, management and operations, the objective center around ensuring a safe, efficient, and effective learning environment for all students. Two areas I'd like to speak to is first B1, the creation and implementation of new procedures for the HES child study team. There's already been work um, on the alignment of the procedures with Hop Hopkins uh, to implement a more thorough and streamlined approach to the process. In working with Hopkins staff, we are able to create consistency across the district in how we identify struggling students and ways to best support them. I'd like to give a staff shout out to Michelle Witowitz, who's been instrumental in facilitating these meetings with the staff across the district. Another highlight in management and operations is the implementation of the HES equity action plan that the school council has worked with me on to promote school-wide events and practices with an equity and inclusion lens. 
I'm extremely excited about these initiatives um, in particular. Uh, first, I'd like to say that our school council has created a vision through the equity action plan that I feel will not only promote themes of inclusion, but will also engage with our community outside of the school. We've started some of this work by partnering with folks um, with the, I'm sorry, with folks from the Du Bois Center and also the Asian Cultural Student Group to perform for us during Lunar New Year this year, which we did a couple of years past. We also inviting families in to participate in the World's Fair and other events for our students. In speaking with the HES School Council, one initiative that we'll be working on this year is the creation of an HES calendar of events, units of studies, and themes that promote diversity. This calendar will be created to first organize what traditional events we have, like the World's Fair, um, in which, and then we can identify grade levels, specifically what, what traditional events we've always planned. After we've organized with staff input, of course, the council then can analyze and enhance our offerings by providing resources and ide identifying additional opportunities for the benefit of pr promoting diverse experiences for our students. Think of a curriculum map, but more of an, a, in a calendar form. One initiative that I also would like to speak about and celebrate is the addition of a kindergarten to grade six Spanish lab for our students. Students are able to have weekly Spanish lessons now that not only expose students to learning a foreign language, but also fosters an understanding of other cultures. I'm extremely proud of our staff for embracing this opportunity for students to learn another language and for the hard work of Mr. Roman, who took on this enormous task of introducing Spanish le lessons across the school. He's worked with me on identifying age appropriate lessons and resources to get kids excited about learning Spanish. It's so incredible to be able to see the students interact with one another in the hallways and teachers putting up Spanish phrases in their classrooms and really just embracing learning a language together as a group. I'm also really proud and happy to see our Spanish speaking students be able to be leaders in their classrooms and take this uh, great opportunity um, and just embrace it. So it's been really beautiful to see. Uh, for Section C, Family and Community Engagement, I'd like to highlight Section C2 and C3, which is to increase and promote family engagement through school-wide community events held at HES. I always work hard to engage our school community through phone calls, emails, and newsletters. And I know that uh, having families come into the school has not been possible due to the restrictions around COVID-19. But, uh, however, our hope in the future is to have family engagement events that invite families to interact, share, and celebrate the diversity of our school community. My hope in the future is to host spaghetti suppers and potluck dinners, which families can attend and be with one another. We also look forward to organizing school-wide opportunities to that invite families in to share and educate staff and students about their cultures and experiences. Examples could be Grandparents' Day, World Fair, parent and family presentations. With more students having the opportunity to be vaccinated and a lower number of cases, our hope is that that can be a reality sooner rather than later. But lastly, I'd like to highlight and thank my staff for their feedback around building a professional culture, which is a priority and strategic objective number D, letter D rather. Uh, I always say that Hadley Elementary School is a place where we strive to model and show kindness, not only to our students, but to one another. The staff has shared this work with me, and we have a con continued commitment on focusing and building our professional culture through professional development, daily practices around inclusion, and positive behavior interventions and supports for students. We examine school-wide data specific to behavior, and we're working as a team to identify how to best address the social emotional needs of students. I'm also working very hard to identify areas in which I can best support the staff and making sure that I listen and hear to feedback in my surveys and also in my daily interactions. I'm working hard to ensure that each staff member feels heard and represented in the building, and especially while making building-wide discussions and decisions. Um, thank you, that's all I have for right now. And I'm open for feedback, questions, anything specific to the plan. Thank you, Jen. Um, I, just, I wanna start by, first of all, thanking you. Um, this um, plan 
um, aligns well with the conversations we had in our two days of retreat and our conversations with Annie and really reflects uh, and, and has taken action in a number of respects um, quickly. <laughs> uh, I, I um, have just heard such enthusiastic feedback for it exposing our young people to uh, different languages earlier than what is typical um, and for, uh, for it not to be so daunting to, to take on some words here and there. It just, it's a great incentive to go on and uh, actually pursue a second language with, uh, with zeal. Um, and, uh, and, and the only other thing I wanna say is that um, I'm excited for when we can have events again um, social emotional learning um, is really promoted by um, all um, community members to come out and interact with the school community. And I find that all too often, a lot of those um, things happen on the sidelines of baseball fields and basketball fields and uh, basketball courts. And that's great. But unfortunately, that just is not inclusive of everyone. Um, so I'm excited for taking advantage of the pavilion. I understand that there will be um, new um, uh, benches that will be, um, that that's the newest initiative that our community members are going to install a lot more seating. I think that'll be a really great place to have more COVID friendly outdoor events. And so um, thank you for your um, attention to those aspects as well. Uh, I'd love to open it up to my colleagues and get their feedback as well. I don't have anything specific, Jen, just to say thanks. Looks like you put a lot of thought, and I appreciate how you've reached out to your, your team. I hear nothing but good stuff about how you collaborate with them, so thanks. Thank you. Same here. I don't have anything additional to add to what Humer and Paul said, and I enjoy seeing your friendly face every morning and afternoon at drop-off, so thank you for always being there and always smiling. I can see the smile through the mask, so... Yeah. I have all the fine lines around my eyes now. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> we do. Yeah, it's been a long couple of years. I'll just say I'm 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 on board with everybody uh, and everything that's been said. This is great to see. I'm excited to to kind of see where this takes us over the next couple of years in terms of this work. I am really, I'm really, really thankful for for all of you. I'm thankful for Dr. McKenzie, who you know. I said, I want to start Spanish. And she said, I want Spanish too. Let's go. And so um, just kind of allowing me to, to take off with it and to have the staff so excited about having this opportunity. And I feel like even though, you know, we're, we're still in mass, we still have a, have a, a long way to go um, as far as getting back to normal. Um, you know, just having some of the initiatives and the addition of the STEAM lab, uh, Ms. Jay Shri, she's been doing wonderful things with the students and um, providing students extra opportunities. It's really been, it's been wonderful to see and get back to the work. So um, I thank you all. Great. Thank you, Jen. And Jen, we know that you have children who are athletes and sporting this evening. So we know that you'll have to excuse yourself uh, shortly and thank you for such a thorough and excellent presentation. Um, and so, Mr. Sednick, our interim principal, what a time to be a principal too. He has to do the strategy document, all kinds of things. I'm, <laughs> I'm truly blessed here. Um, my first time <laughs> in a non-athletic forum. And I must know, I know Ms. Ms. Berger would talk about Jen being at the bus stop and seeing her over the mask, but uh, my, Best uh, inclination of her in that role is wearing a T Rex costume from what I hear at Halloween. Yeah, so that was, I haven't done that in my interim capacity. I really got to step up my game, get some more prehistoric costumes to welcome the high school students in. So uh, she got me there. So I'll let you borrow it next year, Eric. Excellent. I appreciate yeah. it. I did want to be a paleontologist growing up. So that would be like right in my wheelhouse. So <laughs> I, I'm a high end up here, but uh, I appreciate the time today and having me on, allowing me the opportunity to talk about uh, a document I cannot take a lot of credit for, but I'm going to work through it. Um, Ms. Musso has done some tremendous work uh, on the Hopkins Academy strategy document. She, as everyone knows, is extremely organized and detailed. Um, and her and I went through and created a, a script I'm going to go through uh, to try and 
highlight the the most important pieces that we felt uh, that we would touch on. Um, if you do have any questions, I would do my best to answer them. But if it was something that would be more that would consult with April before returning an answer to the school committee on, I'd appreciate the patience as I get a chance to respond back on those. So thank you very much ahead of time. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the 2021 to 2024 Hopkins strategy document was created in relation to the values and vision of both Hopkins and the district. The Hopkins community is committed to a fostering a safe, supportive and innovative learning environment for all students, staff and families. We strongly believe that our commitments to meaningful, meaningful collaboration, thoughtful problem solving and data analysis, as well as diversity, equity, inclusion, set us apart as a community, increase our student achievement. In 2021, uh, that school year, we developed an equity and action plan as a result of community needs, feedback, and feedback from the NEASC, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. This action plan was designed with many goals and outcomes in mind. Primarily through the plan, we are hoping to create an integrated community, provide equitable accesses to resources and opportunities for all students, create a community that is open to transformation and change, create a community that celebrates and recognizes differences, and to create a community that values empathy. To achieve the goals and values that we espouse, there are several priorities described in the strategic plan. I'll highlight some of these for this, this year, and I'll be happy to hear feedback and questions on any and all aspects of the plan. If one notice about the organization of the document, uh, there's a key in the footer that denotes whether an item is related to an NEASC recommendation, the equity and action plan, or the feedback received from the surveys and focus groups on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you'll note um, that each one of the, there's a column and then a number associated with column as I go through and refer to uh, each one. So the first priority that I wanna focus on is A1, curriculum mapping updates. Curriculum is always in need of updating, but this year we have an all department review and update, we had all departments review and update their curriculum documents. From a practical standpoint, teachers are making sure that documents are accessible to all staff and all families by using a common template. Additionally, they apply a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens when looking at text, resources, and instructional strategies. Finally, some teachers are updating standards and creating new curriculum for new courses. Second, I would ask you to bring to your attention to B1, B3, and D2. All of these areas relate to one another and are in regard to positive behavioral interventions and support, more commonly known as PBIS, and social emotional learning, more commonly known as SEL. While these interventions have also been of value to the, to the district, the impacts of COVID have brought the behavioral and social needs, emotional, social emotional needs of our students to the forefront. It is our belief that students are most successful when they are able to self-regulate and engage with their peers in coursework in a healthy and productive way. As a result, we have several action plan, actions planned to implement a PBIS framework at Hopkins, as well as increase tier one interventions in classrooms for, student, for social emotional learning and add more advisory work related to these areas as well. Finally, please refer to C3, C3 gathering data from stakeholders regarding equity and inclusion in C4. As, as part of the equity and action plan, we disseminated surveys to staff and students in June, 2021 and held focus groups for both in October, 2021. These provided information and recommendations for us as a school, most of which were already identified in this document. I have noted these using the key below. While this work is not completed, it is reassuring to know that we are headed in the right direction. There was one more area that was added as a result of these sessions, and that is B6. It is imperative that, it is imperative that all students feel as though they have a trusted adult in school. Feedback from the session suggested this may not be the case. Therefore, we plan on using a social network analysis to identify the student and staff networks in the school and take further action based on these results. B4 makes reference to an engaging, to engaging a program evaluator. In addition to getting information from stakeholders, we are planning to review our policies, practices, and data with an equity and inclusion lens. Um, if anyone has any questions at this time, uh, looking at these sections or any others, please uh, feel free to ask. Uh, please note ahead of time, that again, like I said before, I'll have to check in with Ms. Musso if I do not have the full story on how to respond to that specific area. I'll be sure to provide you with answers in the next meeting. So thank you for your time on that section. And uh, if you have any questions before I talk about the program of studies in GPA. 
Thank you, Eric, for um, presenting on behalf of April Camuso. And I will not grill you hard on what you just presented, but I will. Uh, I will say that uh, I'm really glad to hear, see that uh, PBIS, something that we're familiar with and we've implemented for many years at the elementary school level, is now something that we can bring to the um, high school level. It's a known quantity. We have in-house people who um, who who um, have uh, become very well versed in it. I'm really excited to see us being able to expand that work. Um, and um, generally speaking, I'm really glad to see just everything in response to data, data that we're collecting by surveying our students and our community. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues um, at this time. I'm chuckling because I had written down down the same thing, um, that I'm glad to see PBIS and, and I added in the SEL. Um, and I'm glad to see that it's a big priority in this document. And I'm and, and I laughed, chuckled a little more when you said data. Um, I'm glad that we're able to take that through a, a fine looking glass and really be able to get some meaningful results. So that way we know where we need to work further. And um, one step further, I'm really glad that we have um, Michelle Watowitz in the role that she's in and the capacity that she's in to really be able to um, encompass this work and really uh, really focus some time and attention, have a dedicated individual to that is just um, pretty exciting. So, and thank you, Eric. I think you did a great job. Thank you. Great work. I think uh, I agree with everyone, uh, especially around data, PBIS, and, and the SEL piece as well. Thank you. Hey, Eric, two questions. One is, um, on the, what are, what are 21st century learning expectations? What's an example of um, So making the 21st uh, century learning expectations are making any expectations that we have are more common or sorry, more technological, more in line with the modern expectations rather than kind of the historical piece. Um, I'm trying to think of some off the top of my head. Um, but that's to my again general understanding of it you know in the meeting here um moving things in more modern thought modern technological applications things of that nature okay and then that c3 talks about gathering data and feedback from all community stakeholders any thoughts on how you might do that so we are just kind of broaching the kind of the sel portion uh, this year. It's been a lot of uh, data gathering as far as we had a, a, the program evaluator come in to talk specifically to this, uh, the school um, based team, like the teachers and the students. So I would be unaware at this point, any specific implementation plan um, that would be an advisory program format. Um, currently, our advisories are all set up through um, a system that's implemented by Ms. Sear in the school. So each advisory is um, kind of planned out through a, a whole given system that we have in place. So um, there is talk of reviewing what we're going to be working on in advisories. And if we think those are effective, so that's kind of something we are kind of reviewing right now as a school. So I believe that's where that piece we put in. So um, seeing if some more SEL pieces would be more effective in the advisory um, than what's currently being offered at this point. I can, if you don't mind, Eric, I can add a couple more examples to that. Sure. So examples of equity and inclusion are, as, it, as Eric just said, looking at our advisory. They recently just asked staff and students about their experiences in advisory in an effort to try to um, inform improving that experience for students and for staff. Uh, they're evaluating the schedule again right now to around to what extent does the schedule as it currently is structured, inhibit, or foster a student's ability to access the kinds of experiences that they would like. Like some students have identified that the schedule is actually kind of the way it's structured now makes it difficult to participate in in-person classes at GCC through early college high school, and that's what they're looking to do. We have uh, collected student data and surveys around their experiences of just, are they experiencing Hopkins Academy as an 
inclusive environment, as an inviting environment. Um, we have had so far the Collaborative for Educational Services come in and speak to students at Hopkins Academy as a follow up to the survey and listening sessions and they're going to be doing some uh, listening sessions through instruction with some students that had the elementary school. Um, so the methods include focus groups, surveys, um, faculty decision making teams, student decision making teams, and it could include anything like any structure if we have a desired outcome, uh, an inclusive environment that would be defined as a place in which um, there's proportionate representation in higher level courses among all demographic groups. And then the, the data gathering would be to ask relevant stakeholders, what are your experiences and what conditions foster or inhibit your ability to have this desired experience. There's a gazillion aspect pieces of data that we'll be looking for, but kind of all focuses around that. Good. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Eric. All right. And so, should I move into my next piece regarding Yes, please. Study? Sure. So the, the 21, 20, 20, 22 program of studies um, made changes to the GPA in two ways. First, the GPA scale was changed from a five point scale to a 4.1. And this was done in alignment with colleges as well as local high schools. So additionally, there were changes made to include more courses in the GPA that, that, that were previously were. For example, electives were not previously included in the GPA calculations. This was done as many students opt to major in courses that may not be considered electives, aka creative writing or art. And we find that not including these becomes an issue of equity. The changes were set to be rolled out this year with no impact on previous years. As it turns out, the GPA scale change cannot be made to this year alone. This means that if it's made for the current 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, it would retroactively change their GPA as well as their class rank. As many students have, either, have already reported this information and, and have relied upon it for applications and scholarships, and as we, know, as we had no intention of retroactive changes, we would like to grandfather in grades 10, 11, 12, and this means that the GPA scale change would begin with the current freshman year or the class of 2025. The change to include courses in the GPA not previously included only impacts this year. As a result, we do not think any changes need to be made regarding that at this time. Finally, there was an error in the provided GPA scale where the scale number corresponds to a C was missing and the scale has been updated to correct this. So the long and the short of it, um, I'm not sure, again, not having previously discussed with the school committee, but the, um, the, the major push was to change the GPA across the board. But uh, when they were reviewing and I had a chance to talk to Anna Sear directly about this uh, in April's absence, there was some major inflections of where students rank especially was uh, regarding people who had, or students who had planned their high school career around the GPA and class rank and things of you know educational importance to them. And uh, it would have made a lot more changes than I think were initially uh, foreseen, uh, which could be perceived as unfair to the students who had worked so hard to get where they were for four years. So I, I think Principal Caluso's decision to retroactively change and um, begin it with just the freshman and coming. Uh, so they had a full understanding of how um, their classwork affected their GPA and class rank. I think I would I was supportive of this move as well. So just to remind the school committee, just in case you're wondering, because you approved the program of studies. So this was just a you had approved. We didn't see these issues. They were just unintended consequences. And thankfully, as Eric said, our guidance counselor and others said, whoa, whoa, we didn't plan for this to happen. So the program of studies that we approved, we just need to say, let's start with grade nine, because as it's written, it would have all these unintended consequences. And it would be the current grade nine or the incoming grade nine? The current one, right? It's not 2025. Yeah, give me a minute. I got it. Yeah, it's just got to figure out 2025. Yeah. <laughs> So current, right? They're the class of 2025. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense to me as a, a parent of a Hopkins grad trying to explain to colleges why we were on a five point scale it was unnecessarily burdensome. Yeah, I never could wrap my mind 
around how one could exceed 4.0. So. <laughs> Same here, yeah. Any other comments on this, Tara or Ethan? I'll just, uh, I'll add, I, I think most colleges are able to kind of navigate any GPA scale. We have five and four is pretty normal. There's some pretty wild ones out there. Um, I, might, I, I know I made this comment the last time we had this conversation and I'll bring it up again. I'd love um, as, a, as a school to, or as a school system to move away from rank. I think if we're talking about equity, um, I think class rank only serves uh, purpose to individuals. Oh, did I just lose you guys? Or, oh, you're there. We see you. Are you there? Yes. You're a it little darker. Dark. Yeah, there you are. Hello? We, we see you and hear you. Okay, I just went black for a minute. That was really weird. Um, I just, yeah, I just, uh, again, would just like to say I'd love for us, since we have a couple of years now to think about it before these changes go into effect, um, I'd love us to revisit the idea of, of class rank. That's interesting, Ethan. So do you see other schools getting, getting rid of that? Yes. Uh, uh, both, I mean, I've only worked at two schools, but both of them got rid of class rank. Um, it truly doesn't serve any purpose in, in the college process. Um, and it, it certainly can be something that people strive toward um, that, could, that could be unhealthy. It also, there's ways to, in my opinion, manipulate your academic career to maximize outputs to get a rank of a higher rank. So I just think, I think it's in terms of equity, if we're thinking about being equitable, um, rank going away wouldn't, wouldn't hurt anybody. So does that mean you get rid of valedictorian as well? No, you can still, I, I mean, see, these are all, I, I, again, I think you can keep these things internally. Like, you know, the school I work at now, we keep rank and we keep GPA internally. We just don't share it out. Mm -hmm. um, and at the end of the, at the end of four years, you can recognize who's the valedictorian of the, or, or the salutatorian um, if you, if you choose to. I would, uh, to your point, Ethan, I would love, Annie, if you wouldn't mind, uh, sort of researching and coming back to us so we can talk about this specific issue about rank um, at another time. And I, I thank you, Ethan, for bringing it up. It's definitely something that I've also thought like, <laughs> well, in, in, in my parents' day and age in India, you'd go up to a bulletin board, you'd see exactly where you were and you'd see where everyone else was. And that's like, so like unnecessarily humiliating for anyone to know where they stand in relation to another. It just does not create a, um, a, a, a good, a strong learning environment. Um, but if you, yes, if you, it, we should, we should explore uh, how that fits into the culture at Hopkins um, and, and how we proceed with that. As it relates to the, um, this, um, PO, uh, uh, this document, Hadley, um, Hopkins Academy POS and GPA issues. Are there any other comments on that? Tara? Okay, so do we need to vote on this, Annie? No. I think it's sufficient that it's been brought to your attention that it's, yeah, I think we're good. I don't think you need to vote on it. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric, for bringing this to our attention. Not a problem. And Thank you for presenting. Me. Making my intro to the interim principal world relatively nice and easy one. So I appreciate that. <laughs> you are can, I, can, can I add one more comment on this? I apologize for not saying yeah, I think earlier. you just grill um, Eric right now. Just no, I'm not. Eric. This is not about <laughs> grilling. I'm not here to grill Eric at all. At all. <laughs> um, I just, uh, the, the idea of adding electives to the GPA. Um, I think it's a fine idea. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a bad idea at all. Um, I would just, I would love to see some research done on uh, whether or not colleges are using that um, in computing GPA. My, my guess is that they're not. Um, they're, they're not, when they're looking at a student, they're going to look at their academic courses specifically. Um, and what that might mean to a kid who says, you know, I have, a, I have this GPA, but when it computes out on a college level, it may be a little bit different. It's just something to keep in mind uh, when we make this change. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, Eric, great job and um, come back soon. Thank you. <laughs> I All will. Right. Thank you very much for your support. Thanks, Eric. Take care.
Um, all right, so the next item on the agenda is item D, presentation of HPS district strategy with 2021-2022 priorities, Annie. Yes, so the reason you heard both school strategy documents is after the school councils have reviewed those, the school committee, you'll see that under action item by law, you approve those. We used to call them school improvement plans and we're really trying to focus more on this idea of looking forward and having a strategy to accomplish our goals. But that's why they come before the school committee, come before school council, come before you and you vote to approve them or not. And uh, our, I believe that central office should be, or the district office should be a central services center. So our purpose in central office is to support the work in the buildings and to make sure that we allocate, provide the resources, whether those are financial or time, or whatever resources folks need in the buildings to achieve the goals and realize the vision that they've set with their school councils and stakeholders. I'm not gonna take you through everything here. A lot of these things are long-term. They look similar to past years because they're long-term goals. But if you go down to the third page, I'm only going to highlight those uh, items that you really won't see in a school strategy document. So a number of the bullets are about supporting the work that's going on in schools. That's the most important work, right? If you ever ask a child, you never ask a child, where do you go to district? You ask them, where do you go to school? Um, because school is the most important unit for the students in our district. But some of the things that uh, are a little bit different that I'll be working on, um, applying for funding to develop a career and technical education pathway in public safety and protective occupations. So we have submitted a, a grant to see if we can get funding to do the planning around that. And the chief of police and fire chief signed off on that grant as did uh, Greenfield Community College. So that was trying to marry, we talked a bit about this on our, our uh, retreat, on your retreat is trying to think of innovative ways to deliver career and technical education that kind of connected some of what we're doing with early college high school and address the needs of students who want uh, an educational pathway that's focused more on technical skills. Um, we will be looking to apply for an early college high school expansion grant. Remember our long-term goal was to have what's referred to as a wall-to-wall -wall option for students who want it. So wall-to-wall -wall means that if I'm a student who would like to uh, work toward graduating with a high school diploma and an associate's degree, that that option is available to me at Hopkins Academy. So our first step will be applying for an expansion grant to uh, work through that and potentially plan it out. That's due Jan in January. Um, and some of those other things, um, because there is such enthusiasm about introducing languages at a younger age, um, we also um, wanna connect that with just overall having well-organized and robust uh, programs in second language acquisition, whether that's for children who speak English as their, as their first language and are learning an additional language or children who speak a different language other than English as their first language and they're acquiring English. Um, I'll really be looking and you'll see this reflected in the budget um, to present to you kind of a longer term resource allocation strategy about how we can um, strengthen our language acquisition programs across the board and uh, create additional opportunities for students in early grades. Uh, under B, a big one there, you've heard about many things um, that, the, that Michelle Watowitz is helping us with that we're doing in the building. So there's a big emphasis on um, pushing positive behavioral interventions and supports up. Um, coordinating our child study team. So that means when students look like they're in need of additional help, we make sure that we identify what they need and uh, we figure out how to get them those resources as quickly as possible. But some, some things that are unique to me in this standard, um, one, looking for even additional funding. I know that we have ESSER, that our ESSER three funding that we've talked about before, supporting Michelle as a social emotional learning coach for the district. Um, we had said that we would use that money to um, increase support for interventions for students that have different learning needs. We also just last week, last week, submitted uh, a, 
relatively sizable grant, about $68,000 to um, support this work even more intensely, such as um, setting up what's called universal screening in mental health so that we would use a standardized measure to screen students who might be in need of additional support. The way that we currently screen students is typically through disciplinary data, seeing discipline as a way of students are communicating to us an unaddressed need. But as you can imagine, by using that as the primary way to identify students who need additional support, you're going to, for the most part, only identify students who express that need through what's called externalizing behaviors. We're not gonna catch students who are quiet, depressed, and have internalizing behaviors, have or internalized behaviors, and so we don't see those social, those mental health needs. So our goal is to um, set up procedures and protocols that we can do mental health screening, just like we do screening for literacy and screening for math to identify students who uh, may have additional needs, and then come up with interventions to support students have a robust range of interventions that we use for all students, interventions that we use for students who need additional support. Um, so my job in supporting that work is to try to find as much, as many resources and as much funding as I can to support it. So we submitted that grant, as I said last week. Uh, under this also negotiating our collective bargaining agreements for fiscal year 23 through fiscal year 25 creating the diversity, equity, and inclusion dashboard so that the district can monitor progress on goals related to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Submit a uh, mass school building authority application that falls to me. Um, and for the most part, most of the other bullets are about supporting work that's already been explained to you in the school strategy documents. Great, thank you, Annie. I have one question for you. Um, about the early college high school. Um, I know our team on the um, retreat discussed opportunities to provide our uh, students interested in pursuing a vocation like carpentry or electrical or plumbing, the opportunity to attend uh, Greenfield Community College classes, receive that certification and not have to leave Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And that is an alternative to something like Smith Folk. Um, I wonder uh, whether that falls under um, that bullet um, that you talked through applying for an ECHS expansion grant. Um, is that is that aligned with uh, with that idea? Uh, I think it's aligned with the bullet above it. I'm going to edit this as you as we're speaking. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, I de definitely want to make sure that it's. Uh, the public safety and protective occupations um, item is definitely important and we want to build on that but also um, our uh, i've had a, a number of students talk with me about the kinds of professions um, plumbing electrical carpentry um, uh, the kinds of professions that are very much in demand um, and lead to you know strong careers um, uh, and we, we definitely, a few of those, um, we could definitely work with Greenfield Community College to provide our students that um, certification and experience without them having to leave Hopkins. Yeah. Um, so I added that information to that bullet and the public safety, this grant that I applied for, so one is this kind of a little test to see if the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education would even be willing to imagine a more expansive definition of career and technical education. Right now, it's pretty rigid. You go to a vocational campus. So I'm hoping that if they see something in the proposal that they like, that that was opening the door to, um, does it just have to be either you go to a vocational campus or you stay at your traditional campus? Can we take elements of programs that are effective and and integrate and, and develop different kinds of career and technical ed programming. But I did add what you said there um, great. to that bullet. Thanks. It would be great to get funding to do it. Um, I, I think it would be in the state's best interest in light of the fact that there is a huge bottleneck for those skills 
in developing homes and mm -hmm. uh, in in supporting our ex, uh, expanding industrial um, development opportunities and infrastructure, the infrastructure build, and all that that will bring to um, the state of Massachusetts. So. Um, it would be great to have the state support in doing that. And if not, I'd love for us to think about uh, we're, uh, funding it ourselves um, yeah, yeah. as a pilot to explore what that would look like uh, to have as an alternative so that our Hopkins students, um, especially those who have been part of the community, paying taxes and, and you know generations of alums, that they're not forced to have to send their students elsewhere. And a couple of questions. Sure. So you, you have submit the MSBA application. Do we want to commit to submitting? I thought we were doing that assessment first. And would that inform whether we want to submit or not? Or does that include the assessment? I guess, yeah. Paul, I'm right there with you. That was what was on my mind. Maybe it's assess and potentially submit. Okay. Uh, and, um, Good point, Paul. The other thing, thanks. The other thing is um, create diversity DEI dashboard to monitor district progress and goals. How does, how do you see that playing out? I mean, are there, Maybe I need to familiarize myself with that again. Are there specific yeah. targets and goals that you can say we're making 70% progress? How would you do that? So part of it is just making transparent for communities. A good place for the public and even the school committee to look um, to see examples of this, not that we would use the same metrics because they're slightly different, but this is uh, becoming increasingly common in higher education. So University of California has them, I imagine Stanford has them. Usually what they're looking at when they look at equity and inclusion is they'll start looking at uh, admission rates. So it's just a place to, to present to the public. Um, here's, you know, here's, so in K-12, we might say, um, here's our graduation rate. Uh, here's our graduation rate by subgroup. Here's uh, our post-secondary enrollment growth. Uh, uh, rate. Here's our post-secondary enrollment rate by subgroup. Here's our uh, discipline rate, the total number of office disciplinary referrals by building and then broken out um, by, by subgroups. And when we say subgroups, that just means, you know, anything disaggregated. We'll say it that way, disaggregated. And that can include, so we're not strictly and solely looking at um, performance or even access, like enrollment in, in, uh, enrollment in AP courses. We're not solely looking at that uh, when we disaggregated, that isn't solely uh, race and ethnicity, but socioeconomic status, uh, whether a student is a student with disabilities um, or not. Um, and so part of it is that, and then once the kind of the, here's the state of the state, right, is there, the school committee and individual schools can start looking at that data. So the first, the first goal is to get, get the data out to say, and people can weigh in of like, well, I'm curious about this, or I'm curious about that. And then folks could say, well, let's really make this a priority. You know, it's really disturbing to see that. Um, so one statistic that we know, and it, it mirrors the state, three out of four students on IEPs are boys. Maybe that's problematic, maybe it isn't, I don't know. But maybe the public would like to, to know, like how does it, what does it look like in the state and what does it look like in Hadley Public Schools? And what does that mean? So the dashboard isn't about um, providing the public necessarily with the interpretation, it's inviting the public to interpret the data with us. And if you wanna look at examples, I would say, look to higher ed, uh, equity and inclusion dashboards, and you can see examples across higher education. Again, they look a lot at um, first to second year persistence. They look at uh, how long it takes somebody to complete a degree. They look at popu uh, majors. They look at who's enrolling. Um, they look at things of that nature. I don't feel like we have a place where the 
public can see that information easily and readily. Yeah. And, and it, Andy, can I add, I mean, would we also, would this also be a place where we could also share kind of what different departments are doing in terms of this work so that if, you know, if, if a department decides to do some really cool programmatic stuff around some DEI initiatives that kind of shows up there and, you know, families can kind of see that in, in addition to the data, they can see kind of what's happening in real time in the classroom. It certainly could be. I would say for this year, my focus is going to primarily be right. on just getting the data in front of people, but then what it yes. looks like beyond that, sure. Because then people might say, well, we prioritize that. And now we want to be, we want to kind of know what's happening, what's going on or not. Yeah. My only concern, and I'm sure you'll be sensitive to this, is the, given the small class size, the, how we maintain anonymity for folks. Is, that's incredibly important, right? Especially when we start talking about disaggregating graduation data. So um, before anything is presented, that is pretty much easy to identify the underlying individual on a particular individuals in a particular data set. Um, you know, I would probably bring the problem to the committee, right? And then invite some feedback. And I can also ask partners in higher ed, like just in just statistician people, like what what might you do? Is there a way to look at this longitudinally that is equally valuable? Um, but if I thought there was any way that people could just kind of figure that out, like there was one of X in a particular class, so that outcome is tied to X, um, then, you know, then I would pause and bring the problem to the committee. Um, thanks, Annie, for including this. I, I really um, appreciate the question, Paul, and I, it, we are a district um, that is incredibly small. And, and uh, being on the policy committee for the last couple of years, this has come up with uh, Tara and I looking at like the, the students that might not graduate. We have such a small school. How could we even have students that are not graduating? Like we should be getting, we should be helping get everyone over the finish line. And, and the, the book that April Camuso sent, um, Despite Best Intentions, really helps pinpoint, you know, despite best intentions, these are the things that consistently happen um, to students of color versus, you know, uh, uh, non-students of color, particularly black and brown students. And in uh, as I think about it more, I, I just want to know where we are. If we, if we don't know where we are, if we can't me you know, measure it, then we can't improve it. So uh, to have something that we can sort of measure and then consistently keep our eye on that, um, perhaps we can um, you know, defy those national statistics and actually focus on um, the kinds of things that really make a difference in the lives of the, you know, small percentage of people of color that we do have. Any other questions on this strategy document? Thoughts for Annie? Okay. Thank you, Annie. Sure, the next two items are pretty quick. Um, so I provided a hyperlink in the agenda that really my purpose today is to reiterate uh, some information that I sent home in an email to families today and I sent it to the staff. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and DPH have created protocols for districts when they, uh, when they suspect that they have an outbreak or school transmission. So I just wanna run one more time down kind of our recent uptick because we went from August to the week of November 15th with two student cases that were directly attributed to a household. Remember the household was COVID positive and then the two children in the, in the household tested positive for COVID. That was all we had. And then on Monday of this of last week, we did our pool testing and we had four positives in that one pool. So of those four positives, three are directly related to an event that occurred outside of school. So two of the students and one of their siblings uh, attended a gathering. Um, so we can assume, I can't say that, I shouldn't say that with absolute certainty. We never know. We never know if somebody could have been in the grocery store, but it would be the connection that we see there. So there was a gathering that occurred outside of school. Of those four cases, three of them were connected. 
either directly two students attended and another student was a sibling. And then we had this one outlier. Still haven't quite figured out what that one was. And then, uh, and again, you don't ever know with any degree of certainty, we're just assuming. And then um, a, a student on their, their family, on their, on their own, uh, took their children um, for additional testing and found that, an, and so we learned last week at the end of the week on Friday that another student who had been at this event tested positive. So those are our five new cases. How we went from two um, for a whole, whatever we had there, two and a half months, September, October, half of November, uh, two and a half months, two cases, and uh, one week, add five to that, and we're at seven. We are not calling in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to do an analysis. So we haven't seen school transmission. And I can say that very confidently because uh, as of today, we are at, um, so we were doing test and stay for 26 students all of last week. And today we added a few more. So it's just over 30 now. Um, I think I put it in the email because of the most recent positive. So we have additional contact tracing to do. And we have not had any of those test and stay results. None of those have come back positive. So you had these five and now they're contacts that fit within the definition of close contact that require test and stay or quarantine, doing test and stay on what constitutes roughly 10% of the population that had in the elementary school and we have not had a positive yet. So it would appear that we are not seeing school transmission. If we thought otherwise, we would contact the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, DPH, to come in and assist us, but that's not what we're seeing. Great, thank you, Annie. Any questions for Annie on that? I had some. Um, one, the link that you had from Desi, it, um, I'm guessing this is their frequently asked questions. They, they put mm -hmm. this together, not you. Um, Correct. Is, is this something that we can share with, with families in a superintendent email just so that they're aware of when we need to be reporting and alerting and kind of what sure. sets the tick off for you? Um, mm -hmm. And then um, as far as the as far as the, the process, well, maybe this will be enough, but I, I guess just in general, um, you know, letting parents know the process of um, when a positive case is found, what our process is behind the repeat and ongoing testing that you're talking about that's been done. And I know you, I think you mentioned in the email that there were, you just said it too, and I forget already, 30 kids that were being tested or whatnot regularly. Um, just letting parents know the process of that. Um, and maybe um, just uh, a time frame sometimes and how long things such as contact tracing may take and the complexity of it. Yeah, yeah, I can certainly add that to superintendent newsletter. Um, no problem. Just in case it comes up again, parents know a little bit more what to expect because it's a small town, it's Hadley, and a lot of people start talking. And so if they really understand, I know it's that we have all this in documents and, yeah. and whatnot, but just to remind them as when we get tests, it would just be, you know, positive cases, it would just be helpful that they are reminded of the process. Absolutely, I can do that. And I will always, I wanna say this too, in case people uh, are watching this or they watch it later, uh, please, please, please. The easiest thing to do is to email me or the building principal or the school nurse. That is the easiest thing to do. So I'm very happy to do that. And I understand that people will read it this time. And if this doesn't happen for another 10 weeks, they'll say, oh my gosh, where's that email again? So people should not hesitate. Just, just email or call and say, I'm confused. I'm scared. I don't know what this means. Why did this happen? And I got a couple of those emails and I know how the elementary did. And then we can respond individually to those. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Paul, Ethan? Okay, great. Thanks, Annie. Um, all right, so we are at item F, acceptance of donation from 4Rex Farm. Annie? Yeah, and you'll find this in the action item. So a big thank you to 4Rex Farm. When they read the email about the supply chain issues, uh, they donated, um, I believe it was $400 worth of um, snacks and food and things to carry over that supply chain problem. That was incredibly generous. And I also want to acknowledge that then another parent uh, sent me an email and said, if it ever happens in the future, I'd like to help out. So um, a big thank you. 
we, because it's a donation, it does require acceptance by the school committee. I think we have one of the most generous um, communities um, around. Thank you to um, the Rex Family Farm and also to anyone else willing to donate. Um, I think we should just vote on this now. Um, do I hear a motion to accept this gift from um, the Rex Farm? Yes, we wrote. Great, do I hear a second? Seconded and thank you to for Rex Farm. That's awesome. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great, thank you. And now it's time for the business manager report. Um, Chris, I've just asked you to unmute. Okay, so uh, we have a few reports tonight. The first one is the expense report year to date. Um, just a, a heads up on this. We have made some transfers to grants, not all of them yet, um, because the grants were just recently approved. They were still not um, yet set up on the town side, so I was unable to transfer expenses to them. Uh, so they're kind of just sitting right now temporarily in the regular budget accounts until those accounts are created and then I can move forward and transfer those as well. So there's there might be some lines that look a little bit funky right now, but those will get straightened out hopefully soon um, when these accounts are created. Um, but we're not certainly looking bad. Um, basically any accounts that have overages are pretty much offset by accounts that, that are under budget. So um, looking pretty good at this point in time. Um, so far year to date, we've spent about 29% of our budget, um, which is actually pretty good. It's, it's pretty much right in line, even though we're about well, we're, we're, we're closer to uh, going on 50% of the school year, but some of those salaries are deferred until the end of the year. Um, say all the summer salaries for, for next summer get paid in June. So um, I think that puts us really in pretty good shape to finish right where we want to. I don't know if anybody has any questions on this report. No questions for me. I don't think, I don't think we have any questions. All right, um, next. I'm not sure if it's the grant or revolving, but I guess I'll just pick the revolving. Um, so we have the revolving appoint, uh, report as of 1031. Again, balances look good. Um, the preschool account does not include the October revenues. So uh, you can see it's, it's a lot lower than it was say the past few months. But um, once those are posted, they'll come right back up again. Um, you can see with the Hadley Kids account, we are showing um, a decent amount of, of either holding steady or with the past month actually showing some nice growth. So that's certainly good to see. Um, and school choice, I did move some of the salaries. Uh, we had budgeted, I think it was 750, I'm not quite sure, but seven to $800,000 basically was budgeted to be used by school choice. Um, I moved 500,000 of that over to it at this point in time, just so that's that's what accounts for the big drop that you see there. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions at all about that report either. I don't have any. I don't see my colleagues indicating they do either. Okay. It's quite a crazy lunch column. That's just unusual for you, Chris. Well, you know, I, I did get tired of, of Ann stealing my thunder all the time. So I figured I would make sure that at least I had a positive report to present. So um, that's quite positive. Wow. <laughs> uh, and Do you have any then, sense of how long that's going to continue? Do we know if it's going to continue next year? Uh, that I don't know. Um, I, I, I think there's been a lot of positive comments about it, you know, just in terms of making sure that the families can, you know, get the kids eating a, a decent lunch every day. Um, it certainly helps when it's free for everyone, you know? Um, and I think maybe this, this little trial that they had basically due to COVID, who knows? I mean, they may just find that they've gotten enough positive reaction to it that it might continue onward. I do know that the, the revenues, you know, that the lunch program has been getting are much higher than what we used to see. So that's certainly um, good news. Um, so that, you know, that helps to sustain the lunch program. And it also has the added benefit of uh, 
of making sure that every kid gets a nutritious lunch every day. And I guess a side benefit as well is that um, Diane Zach used to just spend a tremendous amount of time chasing down on uh, you know, negative account balances and stuff like that. I mean, it was really very, very time consuming for her. And huh, there's no negative accounts right now because nobody owes. So I, I think, you know, she is certainly appreciating that, you know, she can focus on more meal related things and less on the administrative side of things, you know, so that's a plus for her as well. Sure. Uh, let's see, then we have the grant report. Um, I actually had to do a little bit of fit all to page work on this because it had rolled on to page two. Um, so we have considerably more grants than we've really ever had at this point in time. Um, three COVID grants, the 113, that first ESSER grant is pretty much all spent by now, $166 left. Um, but the ESSER two, we still have a lot of money on that. Then we have the 119 ESSER three, um, we haven't even touched yet. So. Um, you know, certainly uh, a good amount of money there to spend. We had a lot of summer grants this year. We had the 117, the 120, and the 121, <coughs> which basically covered almost all of our summer um, school expenses. Um, they did come out with another grant just, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago or so, um, which is way down at the bottom, the 437 summer programming. Um, and I got an email from and the grant sleuth um, who asked me if we had any other expenses that we could apply to it. Um, and so I took a look and basically they were all covered by the other grants with the exception of the transportation costs, um, which amounted to a little over $11,000. So I let her know that she checked with the state to see if we could apply transportation costs and they said we could. So uh, we picked up that grant as well. Um, you know, really at, at this point in time, if you look at that awarded amount, admittedly, I mean, you know, there's there's a good amount of COVID grants there. So, you know, it, this is not something that we should expect to continue, but that's a lot of grant money, um, especially for a district of our size, you know, that there's a ton of grants in there. Um, and the, there's a couple of new ones, the 252 and the 262, I mean, 264, excuse me. Those are pretty much the same as the 240 and the 262, they're SPED grants. Um, those are the ones that were not set up yet by the town, as well as that 437 grant. Uh, so, you know, over the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping we get those set up that it will, will transfer uh, expenses to there as well. But just uh, really, I mean, those grants are just a tremendous help for us. I don't know. Anybody um, have any today, questions on that? Yeah, and I was just going to say on the grant today, what we've applied for and entitlement awards, which is some of what you're referring to, and some of these extend over a three-year period, um, that's about $849,000. Again, that includes the ESSER three, it goes over three years. Those are our entitlement grants. Um, you, you, it's still a laborious process to submit all the paperwork, but they're entitlement grants. On the competitive front, as of today, we've submitted ap uh, applications um, for a total of $206,000. Um, of that right now, we know 73,000 have been awarded on the competitive side. Thank you, Annie. Your, uh, your track record continues to improve and uh, we really appreciate you uh, sleuthing and finding those funds and um, applying them to our expenses. Um, thank you. I have no questions for you, Chris, on this. I wonder if uh, my colleagues, Ethan, Paul. No, thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, we are at um, our school committee reports and discussion and item A, finance. Ethan. Yeah, there was a, <clears throat> I'll just uh, comment, there was a meeting earlier this month where the finance committee discussed uh, the possibility of going to a split tax rate. It was a very long conversation that had a lot of back and forth. It was, it was pretty informative, I will say, um, uh, where they kind of just talked about the positives and negatives of, of moving to a split tax rate. Um, and obviously I think since then the select board's gone ahead and approved a split tax rate. 
for next year, I believe. Um, uh, but the finance committee conversation was completely around whether or not to, to move that, that way. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And um, on the policy side, um, I know Tara had to step away for a moment. I wonder if anyone wouldn't mind if we skipped to C and came back to B. Is that all right? So um, can we move to C, fields and capital review of phase two proposal? Sure, I can leave off and Chris or Annie, if you wanna jump in. So we, we received uh, earlier this month, November 11th, a proposal from Brochure Design Group for the second phase of the fields. Um, and they have a good schematic. So the, the second phase would include uh, two additional multi-purpose fields, a softball field and a baseball field and completing the asphalt path all the way around. Um, so this would be, it's, it's about $47,725 and it's just for them to do the, the site characterization and then the, the design. Um, and they're the ones who obviously did our first phase and the oversaw the construction as well. So they obviously know the site. It's the same landscape architect, Carlos. One thing they would also do is, is uh, assess out for a pad if we were to do a concession stand or something like a bathroom in the future, but that's not included in their design right now. Um, there are significant constraints about if they were to actually do something like uh, a bathroom, for example, to actually do plumbing. So. I think the compromise that we had is that they would put in a pad now, design that a pad. So maybe that could be something we add on later, even in this project, we decide that we want to go with a concession stand. But it, um, Chris, anything to add? I mean, I, I'd say we've had good success with these folks. Again, they did a good job, I think, with the first phase. It's a tricky site. Uh, I don't think folks realize how difficult it is. They do the, this is FEMA floodplain area. And so they're very strict federal and state uh, limitations about what they can do when they're modifying the land and on the floodplain. So they have to be very particular. And our, these two, this next phase two will have the same stipulations as well. The one thing I did want to ask brochure design about, there's a, there's a piece of land that is to the north, uh, to the west of the school. So north of the current fields, it's a little pocket of land that we've talked about making a, a practice field. I don't know what's needed. I wanted, I'd like to query with Carlos about how much is actually needed to design that. It's basically a flat field now. I'm not sure if it needs anything more. Um, but other than that, the proposal looks good to me. Chris, you've been working with them. Any Anything to add? Uh, well, I think I should just let everybody know that um, at the last meeting, I had told you how I was working with the um, inspector general's office and then the attorney general's office um and i was kind of getting the i'm i'm away from the office and don't have access to email well wouldn't you know the day after i said that without access to email they did respond to my email so um and they essentially gave us the okay um to go with berkshire design without having to get the three quotes or um going out to bid if it had been over fifty thousand dollars so that was good news because really, I mean, it does make more sense to go with the same vendor that had done phase one. As Carlos found out during the project, it was a pretty tricky area to work on. You know, I mean, there were just a lot of curveballs thrown at us uh, throughout the project in regards to drainage and, and items like that. So um, it did make a lot of sense. So just, you know, just so you know, it is okay um, to award the, uh, the job to Berkshire Design, um, and actually, if you would, um, if you wouldn't mind, it'd be great if we could vote on that tonight, just so I could let Carlos know when he could start to get to work on it. That's terrific news, Chris. I think it's a good idea to vote on this and get this moving. Um, and the only question I have about this, I know we've um, been having conversations with a CPA in the past, and we were going to go back and present sort of like, here's what we did, and we're not asking them for funding for this part of the project, um, but how, uh, where do we stand on that, sort of cycling back to them and fostering that relationship? Yeah, I think this would be that next step, right? We haven't gone back to them, but we could say, hey, look, this is a good story for for that we not only have we successfully completed phase one, we of our own dollars are investing in design for phase two. Um, and here you know, we will be returning to UCPA in the future for assistance with that phase two. And we, we've told them that all along. I mean, it would be helpful. 
we can talk to Carlos Chris about what's the timeline. It would be helpful to have some ballpark numbers as we go back to CPA to say, you know, is this an additional? I mean, we spent what seven hundred thousand dollars on this first phase. Are we talking about the same amount, or maybe? You know, I know there's. I think it's. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same or a little more for the second phase. Yeah, Carlos gave us some very rough preliminary numbers, and uh, I think they were slightly more than uh, the first phase of the project. Yeah. Some of that also is because we have to do some corrections, right? There were some things around drainage. So it's actually some phase one corrections is not the right word, but those drainage things that we want to address in phase two. Mm -hmm. so it's the cost of phase two, and it's the cost of making the drainage a little bit better. All right. Okay, so let's um, uh, entertain a motion now to uh, um, move forward with this proposal. Do I hear a, a motion? A move. Second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, great. Let's proceed. Thank you, Paul, again, for stewarding this important project. Oh, uh, thanks to Chris. Chris has been doing a lot of great work, so thanks, Chris. Great. All right, let's go back to item B, policy, Tara. All right, thank you. And I, sorry, I skipped out and made you skip over that. Um, so um, we met tonight and let me get the, and we reviewed again, the flag policy that was presented at last meeting. Um, and as a reminder, the um, policy that's attached in the agenda is at the recommendation of the attorney. Um, and when we had met last time, I don't think there were any concerns at that time about this particular policy in place, um, but rather how the school committee, I think Heather had brought up, how would we go ahead and evaluate such requests to make the determination of um, what would be approved under this policy. Um, so um, three questions came back um, from the recommendation of the attorney. These are the questions that, that she had put to us. Um, the three of them are, does the flag enhance the curriculum? Um, is the flag political? And how long will the flag be displayed? Um, so we talked about it um, as a policy group tonight. Um, and we kind of amended um, the, the first question a little bit, does the flag enhance the curriculum um, to kind of meet um, and be more uh, defining of what we were looking to obtain for an answer out of that question. So what we um, suggested it be revised to is does the flag align with the curriculum and the district's policies, norms and values? And then that would give us a little bit more information um, about whether or not it would, rather than enhance, it would align more um, with what's being taught inside the classrooms and that it is something that aligns with our district's norms and um, values and district policies. So that would give us a little bit more to review um, upon to make sure that it meets every policy that we have in place. Um, the one thing I had asked about, so again, no changes to the actual physical policy itself, um, but just more this criterion um, is just um, a little um, definition of, of why these questions are being asked so that it's clear to the person that's submitting this request to the committee um, why these particular questions are being asked and that it's more for a review to help understand why they want to have their flag displayed. Um, so that would give us just a better idea of, you know, evaluating why they would want it displayed. Thank um, you, Kara, for working with Annie on that. I'm sorry, I missed you. What oh, was I was going to say thanks in advance for working with Annie on that. Oh yeah, and thank you, Annie, too. So, um, but in general, as it stands, I think that we as a policy committee would recommend still going forward to do the second reading and make the vote for the, the Hadley flag and banner policy. Um, and then at the next meeting, we can come back and just bring, um, bring back the criteria um, in writing just to show you 
um, what would be evaluated unless you have a question about any of that as well. I apologize, I, feel, I missed last time. So maybe I'm, I feel like I'm definitely catching up. Maybe we're responding to a need here that we don't need to get into, but I'd be curious to know the genesis of this. Um, and I guess a couple of questions. Why does it need to be the school committee? Why can't it be the, the, the administration or maybe the administration wants it to be the school committee? Um, and then is it clear what a banner is? I mean, are we inhibiting a teacher putting up something that has pedagogical relationships but could be construed as a banner? So if it has pedagogical relationships, um, yeah, so if it's, if it's a flag or yeah, a banner that they, they would be um, explaining as to the purpose of said flag or banner. And um, the reason is because the, the danger of um, not having a policy as the, the attorney has recommended is that if it's left to each individual to determine um, what to make that decision themselves. And if there's disagreement, then the individuals are left kind of on their own to, to explain why they said, yes, this goes up and this doesn't go up. So really um, it is something that should be determined by having the school committee have the discussion. It allows the public to hear and see why something was deemed to be relevant to the curriculum and um, reflective of the school district's norms, values, and policies. Um, if those decisions are made without, first of all, policy is the purview of the school committee, but if those decisions are not are made in a way that a discussion um, isn't public, I just think it's, I, I agree with the attorney, it's beneficial that um, people hear the discussion. So the flag that has Hopkins on it, we have to approve that. Under this, if the flag, as it were, um, yeah, you would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I should give a little bit of catching up because I'm missing this. Yeah. I'm not sure. So something <laughs> happened somewhere that we're we're worried about litigation. We're worried about some risk. I'm missing well, the sequence totally legitimate questions. And I wonder what the, I, I can't recall exactly the nature of the discussion that happened last time, but there was a question that came up, Paul. And, um, and it turns out that um, it's actually a federal law that all US public classrooms will have a, um, a US flag. Excuse me, that was my alarm. Um, so, those flags are allowed, and um, that might invite that might invite people to just you know ask to put up other flags. And um, what we quickly realized was, wow! In light of um, today's environment, where gosh, flags have become the thing and represent a whole range of different values and beliefs. Um, just over in Northampton, you, ha you have controversy around the Confederate flag being behind a student or whatever. You just, it's a slippery slope when you start to allow just you know, everyone to determine what kind of flag they wish to put up. And therefore, you know, we don't wanna be in a position where we're micromanaging and deciding every little thing, but, for us as a body, I think it's probably uh, okay to say, well, our, we have policies, we have norms and values. It'll, it'll be evident to us whether um, this flag or banner uh, is, is aligned with those or not. And so we're gonna, um, it, it's been advised by our attorney to um, go ahead and take on a policy like this. And so Heather had the great question of, well, are there some criteria we could use as guideposts for making that determination if and when we are asked to evaluate? And um, so Annie brought forth those three and we enhanced it just a little bit to ensure that we were including norms and values and policies. And so, that's where we are 
uh, it's a larger backdrop in which we're navigating these questions and we want to never put it on any one educator to have to make that yes no uh, choice which is perhaps not even within the purview of a school to have um, up on the walls of of, of learning um, so Who's already authorized to affix something to a school building? Can a student just go and affix something to a school building? No, oh. no. So it's a public space. And when the people are in there, they um, have different, um, there are different standards for speech. Um, and actually the strictest standards for speech, strictest are for the people who work in public spaces. So this is why if we ever do a, a we want to build a school, nobody here can say you need to, or I can't go out and say you better vote this way. No teacher can say you better vote you better vote this way. So there there are typically prohibitions on people in a public position uh, espousing what is construed as political speech to a captive audience. And uh, a parent, it doesn't mean right, wrong, and different. A parent may say, I think that that constitutes the, esposi the, the espousing of a political belief to a captive audience. And signs are considered speech, and flags and banners are considered speech. And someone else might say, well, no, actually, I believe that this is something that is directly tied to my curriculum, and it needs to be taught. And what we're saying is we don't want educators to fight that battle by themselves. And um, this is something that um, because it's considered school district speech, that it should be discussed at the school district level. Hmm. Hmm. Have there been legal cases associated with this that we're concerned about? Many, many. And there are many state cases across the country right now where this is uh, being discussed as to what kinds of flags and banners could or should be allowed inside classrooms. So uh, that's, uh, that's easy to, to even just Google and see how many stories there are across the country around this. Is it clear what a banner is versus a poster, I guess? I mean, do we have to, uh, so these questions will help the teachers decide if they can hang up something that teaches the class something? These questions will help the school committee decide uh, if they have any, if the school committee has any questions about um, the purpose of it. So essentially the questions are designed to help the school committee understand the purpose. What is the purpose of uh, displaying a particular flag or banner in a classroom? According to, to Google, it, according to Google posters are made of printed paper and are designed to be attached to walls or other vertical surfaces. Banners are made of vinyl and are designed to be hung from high places or held by people. This is the main difference between poster and banner. So a banner is a strip of cloth bearing a slogan or design. So if, they, if somebody put a slogan or design on a piece of paper, they don't need to talk to us. But if they put it on cloth, they have to? Not according to the policy as it's written, um, that would be correct. Uh, that would be correct. Is this gonna have a chilling effect on teachers being concerned about putting stuff on their walls? I hope it doesn't. I can't control how that's interpreted. I hope it doesn't because I'll underscore again that um, it is very easy for a student or a parent. And I'm not saying when I say this that automatically one position is always correct and another position is always in error. That is not my message at all. Mm. But it is very easy for a student or a family member or parent to say, wow, that X that's hanging in the classroom, that, that feels very much like political speech and my child is now considered a captive audience. Mm -hmm. And I have questions about that. And so while a teacher, I can't control how educators will interpret this, but my hope is that they'll understand that the intent is that I don't want each individual educator to be kind of sorting that with um, students, parents, and families. It doesn't mean that they're not capable of having a conversation, but I'd like them to feel as though that they have the 
support of the school committee, and I wouldn't ask the school committee to support something that they had no knowledge of. Okay. It's an unfortunate situation. I hate how litigious it is. And what a slippery slope it would could be to not right. have a policy. So if you put all this on paper, so if you draw a flag on paper, is that sufficient or is the flag an emblem? So this would be actual an actual physical flag and uh, that's what's currently defined. Right, so this policy pertains strictly to cloth flags and vinyl banners. And if we have to revisit that, we can. Well, Google also says banners are cloth. So basically cloth. So if cloth you put it on vinyl. paper, cloth and vinyl. It on paper, you can hang up whatever you want. Or they don't no. Sell no. Um, and this is to try to balance what you said about micromanagement. The goal isn't to micromanage every single decision that an educator makes. That's not the goal at all. Um, the goal is specifically around, there are some very recent uh, cases that have come up around um, there being debate within a school about whether or not certain flags are considered appropriate and the experience of students of certain flags. And uh, educators have invoked freedom of speech to affix those flags. Um, now educators, any, including myself, you know, educators, when there's a captive audience of instruction, we don't have the same rights. It isn't, I mean, I say this plainly, our, our classrooms are not personal spaces. They aren't our living rooms, they're public spaces. Um, and then we have to treat the speech inside of them accordingly. So no, we're not trying to define every single poster. We're trying to strike a balance between how would we make a decision specifically as it relates to people displaying flags. And this seems to be the most common issue that uh, is coming up and people have, uh, yeah, most common issue coming up. I appreciate you explaining it. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate. And I, I do not want the teachers to feel like vulnerable, as you say. And I, so now help, helping you, that your explanation helped me understand why the school committee needs to be involved versus a principal or a superintendent. Get that. Um, or an individual is, teacher, right? If, a, if somebody yeah, says, I disagree teacher. with that, or you hung that, I now think I want you to hang this because I think this way. So rather than teachers navigating that, this is not their primary purpose to navigate those kinds of debates about people who may think differently around a particular issue or idea. I think it makes sense that the district, and again, the school committee as the leaders of the district, um, assist just, with that. It's just a bigger issue of this sort of litigious whack-a-mole where you sort of regulate or apply a rule to every possible iteration of um, doesn't get to the solution. Mm -hmm. um, it just further exacerbates the problem. I get the response. I'm not advocating necessarily a better response or different response. I just don't think, I think it'll, those people who are already inclined to feel that way will feel mm -hmm. even more, more so now. Mm -hmm. And I'll have another um, issue to argue against and another example to point to about why so i wish we could get to the root of the problem and have that conversation um, but i'm not sure how to do that while still protecting our, our teachers well you may be able to if um there are uh requests or concerns this also allows if the school committee says yes this particular flag or banner does you know, aligned with the values of the district. It does the norms and values. It reflects district policies. It enhances the curriculum, yes. And if somebody disagrees with that, that conversation then is moved to a public place in the school committee meeting. Right, that's one of the things that I appreciate about our body is that we can have that conversation about mm -hmm. um, what is aligned, what, uh, what is appropriate, and what is not. And we won't shy away from those conversations. We have that trust and we have norms and values that allow us to navigate that in a healthy way. Does this grandfather in all the existing flags and banners? I mean, if you look at the gym, it's riddled with banners. 
So what I will do for our next school committee meeting in an effort not to make this onerous for teachers is with the principals, I'll get a sense of what, we didn't ask anybody to remove anything that was already up, this is going forward. However, in keeping with the policy, I'll make sure that the school committee knows uh, what's up and why. Um, and I'll just present that as one batch, not ask teachers to come forward and present that individually. Okay. So this is second reading, Annie. Does mm -hmm. that mean we need to take a vote tonight? Yes. Okay. Um, are we comfortable moving forward with the vote tonight? I'm, I'm comfortable moving forward with the vote tonight. How, how about I present it that way? Tara? Comfortable as well, but I didn't want to speak up in case you know, Paul wanted to, or Ethan wanted to voice yeah. any other concerns. I'll say I, I I'm comfortable with it. I, I get I, I'm I'm with you, Paul. I, I think it's 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 an unfortunate outcome um, that we that we're here that we have to do this. But I do think that having a policy in place uh, allows us to at least I don't know set guidelines or or at least put something in writing that says um, to to Annie's point that that we're separating what is your home and, and what is is your classroom. I, mean, I think we should vote. I'm very uncomfortable with this. I don't, I don't like this at all. I'm not sure if I have a better solution. Um, Abby, we're 20 years for the government. This feels like big brother and uh, hyper reactionary. Uh, yet I get the I get the issue. I get the concern. I was there two months ago when I first heard about the issue, and then when I realized the slippery slope of like, oh, let's let everyone just decide. I. I realized yeah, um, I don't see that as the dichotomy, yeah. but I yeah. don't, that's what I'm thinking is that what is the middle ground here? What's a better way to address this problem? Mm -hmm. So I mean, we can always revoke this if we come up with a better idea. Absolutely. So. Great, do I hear a motion to approve this policy as it stands right now? A motion. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. We're skipping over D, negotiations. Mm -hmm. It was not discussed. Moving on to uh, E. Yeah, because that's I, I accidentally copied that from the last agenda. So that's what that means. Got Sorry, it. we're done with that. No <laughs> that worries. was regarding uh, uh, the, the conversations that Paul and Ethan, regarding vaccine mandates and whether yes. that's necessary for staff. Very good, thank you. Oh, can um, I, I just say? Sorry, yeah. I'm no. just looking at our agenda and we we spent just so you know, we spent our time discussing the flag policy for yeah. our meeting. So we didn't go right. on on use and parent notifications. So that'll be brought back at another meeting. We didn't we didn't touch on it. Great, thank you. Okay, moving on to item E, appoint school committee representatives for unit A negotiations and for unit D. Is that you, Annie? Or is that well, people had expressed interest. People yes. had expressed interest last time, and now I'm struggling to remember what that was. Probably in the minutes, um, but we didn't want to just assign Paul without him being here. So we need two people for Unit A and two people for Unit D. And I heard volunteers last time, so um, I think Paul, we didn't want to make any dis determinations before you had a chance to weigh in and, and indicate what, whether you had a preference or. Um, but I think every. Uh, everyone sort of indicated an interest one way or another. Do you want to express? I'm happy to help. Do you need another volunteer? <laughs> Great. Uh, Thank you. And so remind, I think, yeah, rem I think Heather and I had volunteered for A mm -hmm. and Ethan volunteered right. for D. Um, but <laughs> I am willing to be flexible <laughs> if somebody wants to go to A and not D or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'll help out wherever I'm needed. Is the a is the teachers and A is teachers and D is educational support professionals. So if Paul, you'd be willing to help with educational support professionals, that would be great. Okay. Let's okay. go, Paul. Let's go. All right. <laughs> so all right. The band back together. There we go. That's it. All right. Good. We'll get those meetings on the book shortly. Thank you, everyone, for volunteering for those positions. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And then the final item here is item F, continuation of Zoom meetings. 
draft letter to Senator Comerford. Um, so the link is there and um, you'll see um, a, uh, a draft here of, um, as many of you know, the um, open meeting law uh, emergency order was extended um, even though the um, state of emergency for Massachusetts was no longer in effect, but as it related to open meeting law, that was extended until next April. And I think I've made no secret of the fact that I really prefer Zoom meetings um, for a variety of different reasons. And I've heard Heather also express her support for that. Um, and I wanted to create um, a, a, a way for us to communicate what we have um, felt were some of the benefits. You know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to some of the things we've learned about operating more efficiently um, uh, during a pandemic, use of technology, um, use of new um, Google Calendar invites, digital documents, saving paper, all the things, being able to um, edit um, up until um, go time for a meeting and have the most current information at hand and available to the public. And so this letter attempts to uh, encapsulate that. And what I was hoping was that uh, just like we did with the testing resolution where we said, okay, well, this, this Humera is very strong language. Let's, you know, I'd love to see that a little bit softer. You know, I'm willing to change any bit of this. Um, but what I would like to do is ask for your support in sending this in a unanimous way to the uh, Gen uh, Senator Comerford and to the state legislature so they may start thinking about this before next April. I know their intention was to revisit open meeting law, which is like one of those blue laws that's been around forever and hasn't been looked at at all. And so rather than just going back to the, the old way, they intended to come up with some new strategies. And I, I wanted our thoughts to be factored in really early on, i.e. now, before whatever happened in April. So I, I invite any thoughts or feedback on this and um, happy to make any adjustments. But I guess philosophically, um, are you in support of our ability to decide as a body whether or not we continue with Zoom meetings um, for our regular meetings. And, and by that, I mean, at present, the select board first has to allow a town to, town's bodies to have uh, remote participants or not. And also, um, presumably when that uh, April timeframe passes, we'd all be entirely in person and then at the school committee chair's permission be allowed to have one participant on Zoom or multiple participants on Zoom. And uh, honestly, I'd really rather continue to be very efficient in how we manage our operations and our open comment and all those things in this fashion. Would love your thoughts. I think it's a really well-written letter. Did you write that, Humara? I did. From time to time, I write well-written letters. That's great. I totally support it. I wouldn't change a word. I think it's a, it's well-argued, and I totally agree. Thank you so much. And I, I hadn't caught on that point of the select board, so I, thanks for pointing that out. I didn't realize they had to approve that. Yeah, it's it's not like they oversee our every move, and we are elected an elected body independent right. of them, but they determine that. And so, in theory, they could decide, nope. None of you have the ability to decide to do a video conference meeting. Not that they would, but, uh, and before the pandemic, to be sure, they did say that, yes, at a chairperson's approval, uh, someone who's traveling could patch in, but it's a case by case and it's one member. And we all know that those meetings are very inefficient when you have part of a group, hybrid meetings are just, you know, part of a group in the room and then part, one member, it's just not great. Um, but this, we've been very effective, I have to say in my view, perhaps more effective than in-person meetings. So um, yes, thank you for that. Ethan and Tara? This is all I know, and <laughs> I think it's great. That's right, isn't it? Holy uh, God. Yeah, That's um, not, not, not that I had, didn't appreciate getting with, together with you guys at the retreat. And I do obviously enjoy in-person meetings, but I think in terms of uh, ease and 
efficiency and, and the ability to to do to to attend these meetings even if I'm not in Hadley is just it's perfect. Great, thank you. I, I think that's also really important to get the best um, candidates and the best talent who from time to time might not be exactly where we need them to be. I know in the past we've had someone who's had to lives in Hadley, kids in Hadley, cares about Hadley, but took a job that required a long commute. In this instance, he could have finished out his term at least. Um, so anyways, I think it's, it's, it's important. Tara. Um, I'm supportive of this. Um, I like doing the Zoom. It's definitely easier um, in a lot of ways to try to um, plan time management. But I also think it's important from the perspective of something you laid out in here is that um, community participation. It, it can be really hard for a parent to step away to be a part of these meetings. And they're able to come and hear us in real time and give us their thoughts. Um, at that time rather than afterwards in response to something that was that was said in a meeting. So um, yes, it's great for us too. Um, and I think there's still gonna be a time and a place for us to be in person, such as a retreat or whatnot and here and there, whatever it may be. Um, but for community engagement, I just think it's so much easier for people to be able to hop on a meeting from anywhere to listen into our meetings. And I have enjoyed um, having parents be a part of that and the community be a part of it. So yeah. I'm full support. I have no concerns about any of the language. Same. And I um I did get a note from Heather. As you know, she had planned to be away today. And um, she um, adds that um, she continues to be supportive um, with the uh, she she's happy to have the flexibility of remote participation while also requesting that remote participants continue to be engaged in the activity at hand, reducing outside distractions where possible. And I, I, I think we've been really good at that. Um, uh, I, I feel as though we've all been very present with one another in these meetings and quite efficient. In fact, I feel a little bit embarrassed that we've gone long. We've had a pretty big agenda, but we're 24 minutes over what I've usually run these meetings as an hour and a half. But um, but this, uh, but I, I do think that we we can adhere to that. So with your permission, and um, I don't know, do we need to take a vote on this, Annie? I we do. I, Joanne Comerford did ask for a unanimous. Um, uh, feeling towards this and um, and in writing. So should I take a vote on that? Okay, great. Um, so do I hear a motion to um, approve this letter to be sent on behalf of our body to uh, the Massachusetts State Legislature care of Joe Comerford? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank I you. hope this I hope this works. Yeah, thanks, right. You're yeah. welcome. Terrific. Okay, um, item seven announcements. Do any of you all have announcements to make? Okay, um, I will just make one brief announcement, and that is that um, Hadley Learns will not have a, an event in December. It's the first time in about 18, over 18 months. Um, we're going to take the winter off, but we will resume the first Thursday in Jan uh, January with, on the topic of environmental justice. And there's a book. Um, it's, you can check it all out at hadleylearns.com. Um, and I hope you will join us. Um, and I'll ask you, Annie, to share word of that in your next uh, superintendent newsletter. Great. Looking at the action items, we have to approve the minutes of October 25th, 2021. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, terrific. And an approval of the policy subcommittee committee minutes for October 25th. Do I hear a motion? And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Terrific. Approval of AP warrants for October 2021. Um, I believe this is the one that Heather abstains uh, from. And so 
Do I hear a motion to approve the AP warrants? I move. So move. Second. Terrific. All in favor? Aye. 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 Approval of warrants for October 2021. This is the one I think, Paul, you abstained from. And so do I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. And a second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 And Paul, Never you Never fails. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Um, appointment of school committee representatives for unit A and unit D negotiations. So Annie, we need to vote on that. Yes, so just you've appointed uh, again, Heather Clash and Tara Ruger as unit A representatives for negotiations, Ethan Percy and Paul Pfeiffer as negotiations committee for unit D. Do I hear a motion um, to um, for those assignments? Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And the uh, approval of the HES school strategy document. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Terrific. Approval of Hopkins Academy school strategy document. Uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. And a second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, just a few more. Um, did we already do the one? Yeah, you did. Um, okay, four Rex exactly. Farms, thank you very much. Phase yep. two athletic fields, terrific. The Comerford letter is set to go. And then finally, approval of superintendent's contract. Corrected. Right. Corrected. So that you'll go into executive session, you'll take a vote to do that. Um, okay. And then return and vote out in open session, that'll be quick. Okay, excellent. So let's quickly look at the next meeting dates. We're looking at December 20th, uh, five o'clock for the sub policy subcommittee, 530 for the regular school committee. Does that work for everyone? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Terrific. All right. Um, we're all set there. So we are going to move into executive session next. Um, and we're moving into executive session to discuss contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And we will reconvene in open session to take a vote. We'll need a roll call on this. Vasilian, aye. Bruger, Aye. Clash is not here. Pfeiffer? Aye. Percy? Aye. Excellent. OK, welcome back, everyone. Um, resuming in open session for a vote. Paul, you have a motion? Unmute. You're on mute. Thanks. Proposal uh, is to amend the current contract of employment with the superintendent, in particular two sections, section three compensation. The existing uh, contract omits the actual compensation amount uh, the one that was signed by the previous uh, school committee chair. So to insert the compensation amount, the actual compensation amount that's being paid now, so it's unchanged. So to insert that, and then section 10 of uh, fringe benefits to clarify that the superintendent will be entitled to 29 working days of vacation. I think parenthetically it says 29, but the actual text says 25. So we're amending the text to the actual accurate number of 29. So those two changes. Great, thank you, Paul. And do I hear, it, that's a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, I heard two seconds. Excellent. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Um, appreciate your service, Annie, and I'm glad we could take care of that housekeeping. All right. Well, that is a wrap, everyone. Thank you so much for attending. And we will see you on December 20th for our next school committee meeting. Thanks, everybody. Have a good great night, everyone. guys. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Grateful to you all. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.